Mini episode 1484 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FDH Lounge Mini Episode 1484. This is FDH Management Partner Rick Morris here with one of my favorite FDH Lounge dignitaries, my good pal, our FDH Hoops Analyst, Ben Chu. We are breaking down the 2022 NBA Finals, and we are going to conclude this segment, as always, with making our picks for the finals and I went back and I looked so uh, for whatever reason in 2014 we didn't get a chance to record a finals preview apparently but uh, from 2015 forward it's been Ben and I doing these I have gone a very strong five and two in my predictions over that period of time which would look very good alongside anyone else but Ben Chu a sterling seven for seven check it out check the receipts it's all up there He has done it. He's picked the winner seven years in a row. We'll see if he can make it eight for eight at the end here. No pressure, Ben. Yeah, I know. Of course, Rick. No pressure. We have a very interesting NBA Finals to look forward to. In terms of the path that both of these teams took here, I think undeniably a tougher path for Boston to the Finals. uh, Going through, uh, if you're just looking at legends alone, you're looking at Durant and the Greek Freak and Jimmy Butler and... uh, Chris Middleton not among them uh, there, not not that he's necessarily a legend, as as great of a player as he is, but uh, the fact that they didn't have to go through Middleton, some would say might have something to do with why they got out of the conference semifinals. Kyrie Irving, another one they got passed in the first round. Uh, It was relatively easy for them getting past Brooklyn relative to uh, the next two series that went seven games. For Golden State, uh, they managed to dodge playing Phoenix. Uh, They had uh, Dallas in there in the the role of spoiler, as it were. Golden State, uh, easily their toughest opponent was Memphis. That was a heck of a series. They got to play Denver in the first round without uh, Michael Porter Jr. and Jamal Murray. But uh, them playing Dallas, and as much as I was rooting for Dallas, of course, in that series, looking at Luka there, I'm getting some serious 07 Cavs flashbacks watching this. And the, like, the way they do it on soap operas, where there will sometimes be actors that substitute in, in the roles here, I could just hear the voiceover in my head, you know, like, the role of the role of Mo Williams is being played by Jalen Brunson, you know, <laughs> the role of Drew Gooden is being played by Dorian Finney-Smith. I mean, it was one of those things there where Dallas really looked overmatched on that stage. As, as much as I was hoping going in that they were going to be up to it, boy, once they started playing the games, not so much. Right, and I think it's a very interesting kind of playoff run for both of these two teams, Rick. And it kind of is going to be very indicative of how probably the finals is going to go, especially with Boston having a little bit of a shorter rest in Golden State, who had a full week off after beating uh, the Mavericks in five. Absolutely, that is going to come into play. Uh, Looking at some historical notes heading into this, this is a rematch of the 1964 NBA Finals when it was Boston over, fittingly enough, the San Francisco Warriors because that was before they went across the Bay. I believe it was in 1967 to what would become Oracle. They have since gone back to San Francisco at Chase Center in recent years here. So the only time they ever played was in 1964. I'm going to give you a little bit of a riddle here, Ben Chu, on why it would be fitting next year. When you look at these two teams making the Finals, after the two teams made the finals last year. There's my hint. Why would it be fitting for Washington to make the finals next year? Because it, it, isn't that supposed to be, what was it, the 38th anniversary? You're close. You're close. Yeah. Washington right now, they are the only team from the 1974 to 1976 NBA finals that has not been in the finals the last two years. You had Milwaukee that was in the finals in 74 versus Phoenix, which was in it in 76. You had uh, th- this year, it's Boston, 74 and 76 as well. Golden State was in the finals in 75. 
the Washington Bullets of 75, now the Wizards today, they are the only team from that time period. We're apparently in this 1974 to 1976 fixation, Ben Chu. This should be the NBA final sponsored by cocaine. No, I'm not going to go there where you know my <laughs> protocol with that. Yes, exactly. Uh, but by the way, as far as other notes here as, as well, uh, before we would get back on anything more serious, uh, this NBA Finals of Boston versus Golden State, you have to go back to 2001, the Stanley Cup Final with Colorado and New Jersey, to find, objectively, as distasteful a finals combination out there. So many people that are having, when you look at the poop out there, choose the lesser shade of brown in terms of who they're rooting for, Ben Chu. This is not one that is a likable NBA Finals from the prospect of America, according to me, Rick Morris. Right. And, and I think the real questioning is is that in most cases, I think Boston would probably be the, uh, I guess you would say the proverbial team that everyone hated, but due to Golden State's run of six finals in eight years, that's definitely, you know, I, and I think a lot of NBA fans who have talked about this too, I remember I have a friend of mine who said that he was going to boycott the finals if it was sent to his Golden State <laughs> Miami because it was just such a boring matchup that, you know, the... It's one of those things where I think the ratings for the series is going to be very well, especially within the Boston metro region, and then obviously the Bay Area is going to be do huge ratings. But it's going to be it's going to be interesting because it seems almost more like Boston is the more likable team, which in, under most circumstances it usually is never the case. I know it is very very weird. I mean, I am ever so reluctantly rooting for Boston in this series and uh, feeling very dirty in doing so. Uh, I was rooting, of course, for New Jersey in the 2001 Stanley Cup Final against Colorado. Didn't get my way on that one. Uh, we have to see how this one plays out. One more historical oddity to mention to you here. Had it been Miami that came out of Game 7, you would have seen a stretch. This would have been unprecedented in NBA history. You would have seen a stretch going back to 2010 where... Last year, Milwaukee and Phoenix would have been the only time that either Miami or Golden State wasn't in the finals, and yet they never played each other that entire run until this year. That would have been unprecedented to have two teams that had been in there as much as that going as far back, but playing each other for the first time during that run. There's no precedent. Right, I mean, it's a, it's going to be a very interesting just scenario because we had a, you know, we had essentially. You would say a couple of, if we include the pandemic finals as well, we had a sort of a weird gap of like teams making the finals and teams being competitive too. And there's, we've discussed this too in the past with the overwhelming amount of young talent that's now in the league. We're going to probably see a bunch of shifting in terms of certain teams coming up next season, teams essentially. Like we saw even with the playoffs this year, we saw how Memphis was able to test Golden State and we also saw, you know, in a way to how Boston had to fight through not only the Bucks series, but also the Miami series as well. Very much so, and for all the continuity that there's been with Golden State, this is something that you and I predicted coming into the 2020s, that this would be a decade where you would have more teams in the finals than probably most of the recent decades here, and that's playing out. We are three years in now to the 2020s, and you have six out of a possible six different teams in the NBA Finals. Uh, I, I don't know how much longer that's going to continue to be the case, but three years in a row of teams that have not been in, in the finals uh, you know, previously in the decade, uh, that is really something. Right, and, and I think it's also, too, and we've seen this, too, I think, in periods of time in the league in the 70s and 80s, where even though there were a bunch of major teams, there were also, like, there was a bunch of up-and-coming franchises that either didn't get exactly to that point, or they were essentially like one or two wins away from upsetting either a Boston or an LA or a Golden State or, you know, or a, a, a one that ends of, kind of comes to mind for me is like in the early to mid 70s of San Antonio, right. George Gervin. So it, it's going to be really interesting to see because I think a lot of people did predict that Golden State would be one of the teams that could be there if they would. And I think Boston was. I, I don't think it was a pick that many people made, Rick, but there were people that were thinking that they were within range of taking a jump at some point. There were, and again, i got to admit, I was a little bit slower taking them seriously than some people were, really sort of right around the time of the shift from 2021 20, into 2022. That's when they kind of got it going, figured some things out. For Golden State, uh, getting back Clay Thompson, 
but that coincided with the loss of Draymond Green. So there are some things to factor in as I read this off to you here from our 2022 FDH NBA Playoffs Cheat Sheet available on the main page at FantasyDraftHelp.com. Here is your breakdown of how these teams match up in a number of different categories. In our season-ending power rankings, Golden State 4, Boston 5, SRS, Golden State 4, Boston 1. Offensive rating, Golden State 17, hmm, uh, Boston 7. Defensive rating, Golden State 1, Boston 2. That's pretty rare for the NBA Finals when you see that. EFG, Golden State 3, Boston 9. Uh, TS percentage, Golden State 4, Boston 9. Assist to turnover ratio, Golden State 12, Boston 11. Three point percentage, Golden State 8, Boston 14. Overall on this index, Golden State coming in at 2, Boston at 4, so relatively chalky as far as these two teams being in the finals. Is there anything with those numbers that really kind of jumps out at you uh, either way in terms of uh, what could really portend for the strengths and weaknesses in this series? I mean, the offensive rating for Golden State being a little bit lower, it, does, it doesn't truly surprise me because they have they went through stretches of no Curry and no Draymond Green, so it doesn't, that doesn't really truly shock me. I believe, Rick, if I'm mistaken, not un- uh, I think, unless I am mistaken, like, I believe it was the 03 finals between San Antonio and Detroit was the last time two teams in the top three of defensive rating or just de- or just overall de- team defense has made the finals. So yep. I think most people, when they think Golden State, they think about high-octane offense, Curry shooting threes from everywhere, Thompson shooting threes from everywhere. But if you kind of look at most of Golden State's history in the sort of this Curry-Kerr era, they've been very good on defense. That is true. And they've used the length. Uh, somebody like uh, Clay Thompson, who's uh, very long for a shooting guard, etc. They, they've been able to use that to their advantage uh, throughout this run that they have had, I believe. And I think you're right about 03. This is the first time, I think, in the 21st century that we have number one and number two in defensive rating in the finals. So it is going to be a real matchup there. You start getting into, again, and this has been one of the kind of aggravating things about the finals has been the health of some of the various players. I, I already referred to Middleton not being in there for the Bucks, and my guess that that series would have turned out differently if he had been in there. Uh, again, Kyle Lowry being banged up for Miami. You saw what kind of a difference that made. Uh, Boston comes into this with uh, a couple of guys being banged up here. Uh, Robert Williams, who is definitely going to be a key to the defense against Golden State, especially the rim protection. I mean, he's kind of up and down physically here uh, at this point. Uh, I, and I think uh, Marcus Smart may not be necessarily 100% with his wheels. So you look at it in terms of the impact of all this, and then you got Glove Jr. potentially coming back from a broken elbow to play for Golden State. So it might be around the margins of this series. You know, we're not necessarily talking about any of the biggest stars uh, that are suffering maladies at this point, but uh, enough of those things around the margins could really tip the scale one way or another, Ben. Right, and um, we've seen it exactly with the finals. Not not these finals this season, but they, this year of the NBA playoffs that injuries were... I mean, perceptionally not up, but a lot of bigger names were injured or not at 100%. And I think the finals, I think almost everyone should be almost back to full strength. I mean, outside of, I would argue, maybe a guy like Gary Payne Jr. who is coming back, you know, that upper body injury. It, it seems like almost every other player on each of these teams are probably going to be close to 80 to 90% in most cases. So I think injuries will play a role, and then, I, I mean... The, We've seen it this season. Curry was off injured. Green was off injured. Tatum was dealing with his own issues in the playoffs. And, you know, you mentioned Robert Williams earlier. We, we discussed this too. It's like defensively, they're a completely different team with Robert Williams in there. They are. And in looking at this here, I wonder, I mean, obviously it's a disadvantage vis-a-vis anybody that's presently injured like Williams. I mean, anybody that's playing through anything like that. But in terms of anybody that missed time during the season, like how long it took Clay Thompson to get back, the fact that Draymond Green missed some stretches, as you said, Curry, you almost wonder at this point here, going through the grueling uh, grind of the playoffs here, uh, if, if the ones that missed time earlier, uh, if their legs might not be a little bit fresher at this point, and if paradoxically it might not be an advantage to have been injured earlier this season because 
you've been back long enough to get your wind back, you've got your stamina, but maybe your legs are a little fresher. Right, and I think also, too, is like, we're going to see a little bit just because I think this will be more prevalent because of Boston. They've played back-to-back seven-game series, and I, even though I've never played professionally in the NBA, I've read enough and heard enough interviews of players essentially saying, like, playing through that old amount of games is trying on the body. It takes a lot out of you. And it's going to be really interesting to see the first two games in Golden State to see how Boston reacts to essentially playing two really tough series and Golden State having about a week of rest. And it's going to really, I think it's going to probably turn the tide of the series. I know a lot of people are going, well, it's the first two games, it shouldn't matter. But it really kind of feels like the series will be dictated by the first two games and chase. It does feel like that could very well be the case. And when you look at this here, this is one of these things where, again, the, the, the physical grind of this, Boston having back-to-back seven-game series going in. I know that as somebody that uh, this time of year, I'm always uh, making forecasts for uh, both the NBA and the NHL. And uh, a lot of times I will, or mo- pretty much every year, I will make uh, a full range of predictions heading into the playoffs and then kind of update that as it goes. And that's one of the things I always look at, is that if I'm predicting that a team is going to face more than one seven-game series, or if I'm picking them to have a seven-game series and they've just come off of one, those are the kind of things I factor in as far as making my predictions for the next round. Because obviously that kind of freshness, how your legs are versus whatever the other team went through, that's one of these things here where undeniably, This is something that is going to benefit Golden State. They definitely have the edge in that way. Now, Boston has proven their ability to go in and win on the road with some big games, and uh, they've done it throughout these playoffs already. So it's one of these things where it might sound weird, but if I'm Boston, I'm kind of glad that I'm going on the road here. I mean, even though you got to fly cross-country coming off of, you know, your second seven-game series in a row, because the perception is, and the momentum and everything like that, if you split in Golden State, if you go out to Frisco and you get a split, you're feeling good about it. If you were playing the first two games at home and you split, then it's not looking nearly as good. So I don't know. Is it is it something of an advantage psychologically to be on the road, uh, having less pressure, knowing you just got to get that split to stay in it? I mean, I think in a way I agree with you there. The real question ultimately is going to be for me is, is that for Boston, I would make the argument that they have been battle-tested, they fought through, and they had a very you know, close games, a couple of close games, sixes and game sevens, that essentially could have changed the whole complexion of the Eastern Conference playoffs. But, I mean, in a way, too, the one thing that has been proven is that Boston has been very competitive with Golden State in the regular season, this season. So I wouldn't put it past them that if, if, I'm, if I'm their head coach, he may know, I'm just going into the to my players saying, look, we're, we're not trying to go up 2-0 in this series. We're trying to get our sea legs. We're trying to get our just get into a situation where we can either have this series tied at two games apiece or get it into a situation where we can be up 2-1 and have all the momentum going our way. Right. And in looking at this, it, this is one of these things where, and I've talked to you about this off-air a little bit, and it's something that's kind of puzzling to me, and I know it is to you a little bit as well, because I don't think there's any necessarily one thing we could put our finger on But for whatever reason, uh, the computer models, the advanced stats, really seem to favor Boston in this series. Uh, I I looked up the updated odds today at uh, 538, and I think they've got the Celtics as like an 83% favorite. I was looking at the advanced stat that uh, ESPN uses, and it was really similarly distorted. As it was showing the plus-minus for each team, as you see the Celtics with a plus number showing that, uh, again, in the public mind, in the, in the mainstream gambling circles, uh, Boston is an underdog in this series. And the last time I can really remember a split like this was 2019 with Toronto, where 538 was on them ahead of time and some other ones were. And you were on Toronto at that time. This is part of your winning streak because where you were right and I was wrong, the only times over the last uh, seven years were 2019 and 2021 because I had Phoenix last year and I had, however, reluctantly, Golden State in 2019. So as you, as you look at this here, can you, can you start to wrap your arms around this at all as far as why the computers really seem to love Boston so much? I, I think it's because a lot of these data models and data sets really put a premium on defense. Okay. And they do also, too, is that Boston at the 
the first half of their season, they were pretty much in the middle of the pack with pretty much everything offensive rating. I mean, defensively, they were in the top ten, but essentially they were in the middle. Mm-hmm. I think the reason why statistically they the stats like Boston so much is defensively they're one of the best net rating teams in the league. They also are very deep in terms of shooting and percentages and I think the math of it all at the end of the day, it feels like a favorite Boston the most because statistically, if you're within the top five of both categories, Rick, mm-hmm. the math is going to dictate that you have a higher opportune chance of winning because your offense and your defense will be able to keep pace with any team. Well, you know, when you talk about the shooting, and this is one of these things here, without the season stats and all the splits in front of me here, like, I see that Boston is 14th in three-point shooting, but that's one of those things where, again, we talk about the before and after point of them figuring out and putting the pieces together. I mean, I'm, I'm going to guess they were probably like 25th during that first stretch of the season if they're 14th overall, because you would look at 14th uh, at it right here and figure, well, this is not necessarily a strength of theirs, but if that 14 is dragged down by so much that happened before the point where they flipped the switch, that's the only thing I can figure right now. Right, and I think the one thing, too, is, is that while I do think playoff odds and statistics odds are very important and just understanding analytics also matters, at the end of the day, analytics can only take you to a certain point with almost anything in life. Mm-hmm. So I feel like I understand why the math loves Boston, and I can understand why, because I think mathematically what the perfect NBA team is to a computer or to any sort of just data analysis is a team that is balanced both offensively and defensively. You make the argument that Boston, in this little stretch starting from like post All Star break to the playoffs, is arguably the one of the, could you could even say it the most balanced team right now. They may very well be their depth and all these other ways that they're able to beat teams. And what's interesting is, and I'm not necessarily saying it has anything to do with why they're both, uh, you know, outside the top ten in assist to turnover ratio, Golden State being 12, Boston being 11. But, uh, again, they're, they're similar in the sense of, uh, again, uh, how much they like to do the ball movement, some of the passes that will leave you sometimes being ripe for turnovers. But Boston now has in common with Golden State the fact that uh, they have, I would not necessarily say Steph Curry is essentially a converted uh, point guard, but he's not necessarily what you think of when you think pure point guard because you think of his offense first. And Curry's a guy over a period of time who, again, he's gotten the point guard stuff down. But let's face it, if he was a guy that was like 6'6 instead of what his height is, they never would have put him at point guard. He had to play and he had to learn point guard in the NBA because of his size. Marcus Smart has similarly converted to point guard, and uh, it has coincided with Boston playing well. Uh, But it's just very interesting in the sense that uh, when you're looking at any of what you would consider to be the pure point guards in the league, like Chris Paul, Neither one of these teams has a guy like that without any kind of a slight on their overall skills. It's just a different way of running their offense. Right, and I, I think, and I, we've discussed this too, Rick, off that I think the whole pure point guard narrative is going to start, with the evolution of the game, that's just going to start to change. We, we've started to already divert from the past of like John Stockton style of, you're going to get 15, 16, 18 assists a night no matter what you do at the end of the day. It's just how the league has changed offensively and how... If in the old days, I'd say, Rick, in the 80s and 90s, if you were moved like teams like Magic, and if you were to move teams like uh, the Lakers and the Pistons with like guards who were really sort of scoring heavy, but they were able to make passes, I think at the end of the day, the league is evolving more towards with the more free flowing style, which is how the offenses are run these days. They're more focused on not necessarily finding a four general to lead them at the end of the day, but they're more able to focus on creation of how offense works at the end of the day, how their how a guard is able to distribute, how, you know, centers are able to move and make three pointers on at any period of time now. So I think the old level of thinking is going to start to wish away a little bit. I mean let's you to use the best analogy and we'll just I'll, I'll go on a minor tangent is that we saw young know, Nikola Jokic won his second MVP this year. He is among the leaders in center assists yearly now and I don't think we 10 years ago would think that we'd see a center in the top 10 of assist totals in the NBA that was like the first since Will Chamberlain had done it in the early 70s so the league's evolving and I think thought processes are starting to evolve too 
Very much so. That, that is an excellent macro level point that you uh, made there. And uh, I completely concur with that. And uh, again, it feels like both of these teams are emblematic of where the league is going. And this is a thing where, again, three years later, after the Toronto Golden State Finals, uh, that uh, at that time, uh, you and I had a little bit of a split decision on that. Because, again, I would love to pick against Golden State in any given year. But, uh, again, it is indicative that when my favorite team, uh, the Cavs, were playing them over the course of the four years, I picked correctly every time, as did you. Both of us picked 2016 coming in because that just had a little different of a feel uh, to us uh, on this. I went with Golden State in 2019. You were with Toronto and with the computer models at that time. I know you weren't necessarily just abiding by the computer models. You had your own reasons, but they happened to coincide and diverge uh, with, uh, with that. Looking at it three years later, you can tell from the course of the conversation here uh, that uh, this time you were leaning away from the computer models and towards Golden State. So uh, talk about your reasoning on this, that uh, going with the Warriors for your shot at going 8 for 8. Sure. Uh, I mean, Rick, just in general, I would I really like to pick Boston because Boston, just based on the data alone, is just really old. But my, my bigger thing is not necessarily that Golden State is that heavily favored against uh, Boston. But the two things that we discussed are essentially for me two points. One point I feel that we've discussed already the death that Golden State's going to have a week of rest. They have home court advantage. That's going to be huge for them. They It's been a while. If I, if I don't remember probably the last time they actually had home court advantage was the Toronto, fin- was the Toronto final. Yes. Two. I believe so. So I, I feel like they're a little bit more in that headspace of like they're you know they're champions they've been here before they're going to get home court they're they've had a little bit and i'll say this they've had a little bit easier of a road for boston and in my opinion once you get to the finals once you gain home court and on top of that you also get the ability you also get the ability for a full week of rest which as we've discussed draymond green steph curry clay thompson are all over 30 now so like a lot of people have discussed, and a lot of athletes have said, the older you get, the recovery period takes a little bit longer. And yep. I feel like that's one of the benefits to Golden State is that they're going to be able to deal with some of the championship pressure. I know Boston's been within range, but again, getting to the finals and playing in the finals are two completely different things. I, I've said this to you off uh, off air too. It's like I would not be shocked to see Boston win. Because they have been very battle tested, and Jason Tatum has taken his game to a next level. I just feel the issue I have with Boston right now is they kind of slept walk in their last two playoff series, and I feel like the one team you cannot sleepwalk against is Golden State, especially with home court advantage. I would agree so with I that. I think it's going to be a very good series. I'm, I'm predicting it'll probably go six, but I just it's very hard for me to be confident in this Boston team because they probably had they've had they have multiple opportunities in both their series against the Boston against the excuse me, not Boston, but against the Bucks and against the Heat to where they could have ended that series earlier and they kind of just let it lapse. That is true. Uh, and again, while Tatum uh, again, he had been uh, somebody that had really broken through to another level during the season here in terms of uh, public perception as far as being a legitimate MV- MVP candidate, somebody that you may possibly consider to be a top five player in the league at this point in time. So too during their rise uh, has that coincided with the rise of Jalen Brown. But what's interesting as I look at kind of the reaction during the playoffs here, when you talk about that and Boston's ability uh, to capitalize breakthrough and maybe end these series a little bit more, is that Brown is getting a little bit of a rap at this point as far as somebody where he'll give you the points. He, he may go out there and really have an outburst in terms of points, but as far as other things on the court, there's been a little bit of criticism of his all-around game during these playoffs here, and I think that's going to be one of these things where he's going to have to really spread his wings and help in a variety of ways if they're going to be able to win this. Right, and I think, Bob, the one thing that Boston does have in terms of it being against Golden State is their depth is very good. We've seen a lot of different looks that they can... The one thing that I would say that I would favor Boston for instead of Golden State is is that the one weakness that we've seen from Golden State in recent memory is they do have trouble with athletic young guards. And guys like Tatum and Brown, they don't really have great matchups for them. They have guys who can guard them, Gary Payton, who will probably 
being probably the main assignment on either Brown or Tatum for percentages of those games. They also they also have Andrew Wiggins as well. So it's going to just be interesting with that. I just my major thing, right, is that I just feel like Boston has been battle tested. But the thing that concerns me about that is if you give away a, a home game to Golden State, the series is over. In my opinion, I agree. And I, I just I don't feel confident enough that Boston is going to win theirs. If you want to make a comparison, I felt more confident in Toronto winning because it felt like more that Toronto outside that Philly series this was the better team in the East. It was the better team at many points mm-hmm. during the playoffs. And I feel like Boston has kind of just escaped. I have the same kind of feeling as well, and that's why I'm going to go with you on this pick here. And again, uh, as with any of the times of the past when I've picked Golden State, only incorrectly in 2019, always reluctantly, but I'm going to say Golden State in six as well because I, I have this sense, again, of that Boston, you know, they may uh, just, uh, again, uh, give away a game, as you said, and this is a deal where, I mean, yes, they did finally break through to the finals after coming up. Uh, empty in the 2018 and 2020 NBA Eastern Conference Finals. Uh, but again, there's a little bit of a thing here where, you know, they, they didn't face the Bucks with Middleton. It took them seven games to get by them because of some opportunities they gave up uh, to a Bucks team that, again, when you take uh, arguably their second best player out of the mix, I mean, some would say Middleton, some would say Holiday for all the ways that he helps you. But I mean, you know, one of their big three guys is out of the mix and it still takes Boston seven games. Uh, and then, I, again, with some of the issues that uh, Miami was having uh, health-wise and otherwise in the Eastern Conference Finals, yeah, I mean, not every time does a team break through and they have the look of like, oh, they finally broke through. Sometimes it looks just like, oh, okay, well, you know, they made it this time. Let's see what they do with it. So I'm kind of in the same place you are, which is what puts me at Golden State in six. My thing, too, Rick, too, is, is that ultimately this series is going to come down to for, uh, I would say, I, many people are going to say Golden State offensively is going to be the No, I think Golden State's defense, that's going to be the big story. And if the X factor is essentially for, their, for them, so probably it's going to come down to guys like Gary Payne, to guys like Andrew Wiggins, guys like Otto Porter. And just, it's going to be very interesting to see because Golden State, I think statistically, is not as good because they went through stretch. I think uh, it's one of those analogies we've discussed too, where I feel like this is where the stats lie a little bit because Golden State was so off injured for most of the season. It was really hard to get a whole good grasp on how that team was statistically during the regular season. I would agree with that. And uh, again, there is... Because we tend to forget, the only reason we kind of forget about Golden State was, was that Memphis had a fantastic regular season. Phoenix won 64 games. But I said this too, and we've discussed this. In the first 25 games, I felt Golden State was still the best team in the league at that point. They just visually looked like they were the best team. And then the green injury happened, and they kind of got off course a little bit. And remember, too, we tend to, we might forget this, but let us not forget that Golden State and Boston have a little bit of beef this year because it was essentially Marcus Smart who dove in the Curry's knee that caused that injury earlier in the year. That is right. That's correct. Yeah, so it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. I just feel like this kind of has felt like a Golden State year, and it looks like it's a Golden State year. And I think ultimately, Boston is going to give them the best. I would argue their best opportunity. At, uh, this might be you know their opportunity to topple a Golden State giant, but it just to me it feels like the road that you take here is indicative of YouTube, how you'll play in the finals, and I just. It's hard, Rick, to play two seven-game series in a row and then have enough energy at the end to face a team like Golden State who has that championship DNA and has already been protected and has home court, too. So it doesn't feel like anything's going in the favor for Boston. But and it, then again, though, they've proven so far in the playoffs, like, perceptionally, everything doesn't need to go their way for them to win games. That's true. And again, the, the, the fact that it's... The younger team, the less experienced team, uh, that is going to have. And in most cases, too. Sorry if I'm interrupting, Rick. In NBA history, the younger team never wins. Usually, that's a great point. That's a great point. And, usually, uh, yeah. And Boston. I'm trying to think of even any situations at the top of my head where the younger team was the one who was able to break through. 
it's pretty I rare. I don't think of anything off the top of my head at this it, moment. It's pretty rare. Experience generally is uh, very, very important in these matters. And uh, again, right. you look at, I mean, you know, Boston is, yeah, they got Al Horford, but I mean, that's like the exception to the rule, right? And certainly the core players, when you're looking at Tatum and Brown, uh, they're still both Cubs relative to what uh, the Golden State guys are. So, yeah, so this is where we come out. And I think and one big thing, too, is how this is where Golden State getting home court is going to matter. Because I do, I, it's very possible, I would argue, too, Rick, I feel a little bit differently if it was in first and Boston had home court in this series. Yeah. That but meant, it, it just, it feels like a coronation again for the new Warriors 2.0. And it just feels like, to me, Boston can win the series if they are able to sort of force Curry and Thompson into bad looks, but it just it, it, it just really strikes me that this feels like their first real taste at the finals, and I feel like they're going to be back at some point, whether it's near-term or long-term, but it just feels like this is going to be their first bite at the apple, and we've discussed this already. Most teams, when they go after the first bite of the apple, never win. I agree with that, and I have to say, too, that, again, uh, for me, watching Golden State, if they win it, I mean, that's going to be very unpleasant. I'm sure I'm going to be vomiting, but by the same token, I don't look at this as any kind of trepidation of, like, oh, no, it's the second half of their big run, because, as you pointed out, as uh, Curry and Thompson and Green age, I know that the uh, their, their ownership is singularly annoying with patting themselves on the back, their self-satisfaction, but you know what? Get back to me when Jordan Poole's your best player a couple of years from now, or Andrew Wiggins. You know what I mean? I have no fear whatsoever that this is going to be Dynasty Part 2. They may make it back again. They may win again. But it's never going to look like it, like those four years for them ever, ever again. No, no, no. And uh, I think, too, like, and I've known this too off air in other views, like, I do think this extends Golden State's title run for a couple more years, three to five, roughly. It's potentially, yes. It very yeah, well I could. Think it's, it's roughly about right on point with that. So they're going to be a force. And I think, again, this is what I've always discussed, too, with teams. And we've mentioned this, too, Rick, about teams who are trying to get from the middle to the top. At the end of the day, it's like the one thing you have to learn is that when you're on top, sometimes you have to have a couple of down years to retool and rebirth your life. We saw this most prevalently with the Spurs in the 2000s where – their big core of Ginobili, Parker, and Duncan was starting to get a little older, but then they were getting able to new Fred from new talent with guys like Danny Green and Kawhi. So it, it it feels like this is like Golden State's second half of their little bit of a run, and it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see how the West is gonna play out too, because I think there are a lot of people, and I think I had friends who were picking Memphis to beat them in the second round of the playoffs, and. It's very possible that this could be Golden State's best chance at another ring. But to behoove the whole narrative, I don't think that team's going to get worse in the next couple of years. The only question for them is going to be is how good is everyone else going to get? Right. Well, there's any number of other teams that are on their way up that are only getting better. Denver will apparently be back at full strength next year. So you, you've got it's – it's just going to get tougher and tougher. Memphis has that uh, very critical year under their belt of being a contender and learning what that's like. And we could go on and on here. So, yeah, it's not going to get any easier for Golden State. And you look at the back end of Kobe's winning years with the Lakers, as you say, the end of the San Antonio years in the mid early to mid-2010s. The second half was never as big as the first half was. So we'll see that with Golden State. I think that's going to continue to be the case. But, uh, yes, as we go through here, uh, that is our, I'd say, very excellent, very comprehensive look at this uh, NBA Finals for this year. Thank you for bringing everything to the conversation, as always, my man, the great Ben Chu. I appreciate it, Rick, as always. I'm still waiting on the residual checks. Yes, well, uh, apparently uh, I have a thumb drive on your way uh, with some FDH coin on it, so hopefully that's holding steady okay. on the crypto market. <laughs> yes, so <laughs> we, will, we will see what the value of that uh, is. I, I think I would know, too. It's like I think the league was a little bad. Miami didn't make it so we could make any FTX references. So Yes, exactly. It, uh, so <laughs> we shall see. But, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how all of this plays out. Uh, hopefully the finals will live up to this conversation. We shall see. But uh, that will be coming in the time to come. And, of course, we'll be back to break it down with you after the fact. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to FDH Lounge mini-episode 1484.